we have to start with ketchup. So the most, uh, one of the most incredible employees I've ever met, his name is Mohammed. He works in a ketchup factory. He's amazing and he's so passionate. He's a ketchup salesman actually. And he just goes around the world selling ketchup tens of thousands of metric tons at a time. Ketchup. And so I was like, I was working with this company. It was like, I don't know, maybe three years ago. And, uh, and I met Mohammed and he's so energetic and so passionate. And he came up to me and we were talking for a little bit and I'm like, why are you so passionate about ketchup? And he says, I'm not, I'm not passionate about ketchup. Nobody's passionate about ketchup. I'm passionate about my family. And I was like, huh, interesting. So I, I said, tell me a little bit more about that. And he's got, he's got uh, his small family and he's working basically for them. And that's how he introduced me to the idea that, you know, he's, he's actually there. He believes that he's selling ketchup, not for the company, but for his family. And I thought, man, that's a really amazing way to see your, your business, to see your role at work is to know that you're there not working for the, the, the company. Cause let's, let's face it. There is no Petrofac out there, right? Like if we were to take, if you were to ask somebody here, who do you work for? And they say Petrofac and you say, where is that? They would give you the name of a location. Maybe they would give you an office address in Sharjah or a site somewhere. But actually there's, there's no Petrofac out there for us to work for. There isn't. There's only the collection of people that work in Petrofac that have agreed to all work together and in all working together somehow meet all of our personal visions and personal goals and make sure our, our, our families are taken care of, our, uh, our parents are, are, are cared for in their old age, our kids are educated. That's what we actually work for. We work for eventually just, we work for ourselves, we work for our families and we work, we work for each other. That's who we work for. There's no Petrofac out there for you to point to. If you wanted to go and meet Petrofac and ask for Petrofac's expectations of you, there's no one to meet. There's nobody there. It's just a group of people, a lot of us, 13,000 of us who've agreed that we're all going to move oil and gas around the world better than any other oil and gas team there is. And in doing so, we're all going to get cared for. We're all going to get our kids educated. And some of us, you know, we're, we have uh, different kinds of goals, different kinds of aspirations. So maybe you want to buy a new house, you want to buy a new car, you want to retire early. All of us are headed toward our personal visions for our lives and achieving our personal goals. And that's why we're here. We've agreed like Muhammad agreed with the guys making ketchup. He's not passionate about ketchup, right? But he's passionate about his family and he knows that the best, fastest, most effective way for him to reach his personal goals is to move ketchup around the world better than any other ketchup team in the game. And that's how it works. That's how ketchup changes Muhammad's family. And that's exactly why I do. That's why I'm, uh, that's why I'm here this morning is because I believe that being here, spending the next couple of hours with you is the best, most effective, fastest way for me to achieve my personal goals. Otherwise, I wouldn't be here and neither would you. We've all entered into the same agreement with the organization that we've, uh, that we're partnered with. We entered into this agreement on the day we signed our employment contract. We believe at that time that the best, most effective, most efficient way for us to reach our personal goals is to partner with this team, moving oil and gas around the world better than any other team in the game. And in that, we're going to make our personal goals come true. We're going to make our personal vision a reality. We've all made that agreement with each other. And we trust our HR department and our recruiting departments to sort out the kinds of people that we want on our team, the kinds of people that we want to be partnered with, the kinds of people that will play this game very well. And that's the trust that we have in each other is that everybody on the team is going to play their part really well. We're going to be the best team in the game. And then we're all going to win all of us all at the same time, all together. All of our kids are going to get educated. All of our parents are going to be cared for. And some of us are going to drive sports cars home because that's what we're actually working for. Right now, I've 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 run across this idea in management so many times over the last 20 years. I've been in uh, leadership and management training for 20 years. I've been six years here in Dubai, five years in Yemen before this, eight years in Estonia before that. I've started seven of my own companies. I've worked in more than 100 companies in 30 countries around the world, and I've consistently come across this interesting phenomena that uh, that people on the weekends, when you ask them what they do. And about how passionate they are about their work, they'll say, oh yeah, I work at, I work at Petrofac, but that's not really me. You know, I'm, I'm actually like this, 
this is who I really am, right? And I'm like this in the evenings and on the weekends. This is who I really am. But when I'm working, that's, you know, that's my work. That's what I do, but that's not really who I am. And I want to challenge that assumption. I want to challenge that idea because I know that some of you feel that way. I know that because of my experience in this field, some of you feel that this place that you come to five days a week, that this isn't really you. And I want to challenge that assumption uh, based on two things, two ideas. One, every decision you've ever made in your entire life has led you here. You're, you, we all have uh, free will. We all have the ability to choose. None of us are victims or slaves in this room. And so the, the sum result of absolutely every decision you have ever made in your entire life has led you to this red chair this morning. This is who you are. You came here. You didn't have to. Nobody's forcing you. You have the ability to, to make other choices, right? Secondly, you're spending a third of your life here. More time probably with the people at Petrofact than you're spending with your own family, many of you. That's a huge chunk of your life. That's not other than you. That's 30% or more of your life that you're spending. For the, for the amount of time that you're with Petrofact, whether it's 10 days or 10 years, doesn't matter. For that period of time that you've partnered on this team to win the oil and gas game, you have partnered with these people for a third of your life. That is not a small sacrifice. And that is not other than who you are. This is who you are. Otherwise, you wouldn't be here. If this was really, really horrible for you, a horrible, torturous, evil, and, and, and disimpassioned and disempowering experience for you, you wouldn't be here. None of us would be. So we need, first of all, to accept that this is the total of, this is the sum of our decisions that brought us here. We're empowered. We have, we have the power to choose. We've decided to join this game instead of the ketchup game. We're not in Muhammad's ketchup game. We're in this game. But we're empowered to choose this, and we're spending a third of our life at this. That's not a small bit. We're empowered. So we might as well, right, be good at it and expect the people around us to be good at it. That's how we win the game. Um, I want to talk a little bit today about values. Do you guys have, um, do you have your personal values? Do any of you have, have you ever written them down? We have company values. Oh, I know. I know. I'm going to get there. Yeah, I want to know, like, personal values. You have? I have many. Don't waste your food. Be honest with the people. I have many personal values. Excellent. Excellent. Like, I have, um, I, I encourage uh, all of the managers that I train to do this. I want you to do this, actually. Uh, take out your phones. You've got your phones with you. Some of you have muted them and some of you have not. Take out your phone. Open up a little note. I want you to write down three words that describe you. I have five. Five core values. Now, these five values I have lived my, my life by for the last 15 years since I actually sat down, went through the process, edited them, refined them down. I, I used to have, when I was in my early 20s, I had 11 core values. I shaped them down to five a number of years ago. And now I've lived uh, my life by these five values. Loyalty, generosity, curiosity, destiny, and passion. Those are my core values. I just want you to write down three words that you would say describe you. The kinds of decisions that you make, the kind of person that you are. Give me one word. Active. Active. Yeah. Okay, excellent. Sunday morning, so don't compare it. Yes. <laughs> yeah, I know. Active. Okay, so here's the thing. Values are revealed through behavior. Okay? A value is how you see yourself internally. It's how you you view your decision making and you view your behavior. The challenge is, do other people see it as well? Our behavior doesn't determine our values, it reveals them. So who we are, we actually show to other people by what we do. Nobody's going to see inside your head, right? Nobody knows your motives. Nobody's ever going to judge you by your intentions. No other person on the planet can see your heart, your intention, your, your plan. Nobody sees that. All they see is your behavior. They see what you do. They see who, the, uh, who you're with. They see what you say. They hear your voice. So your behavior is what actually reveals to everyone else who you are. And in that sense, who we are is what we do. 
what we do reveals the kinds of people that we actually are. And yes, of course, there's opportunity for misinterpretation and mispresentation, but you've told me that you're active, and I want to know if there's any behavior to back that up. So just give me an example. I want you to give me one example from your personal life of you being active. Anything. I wake up 5 o'clock in the morning every day. That's awesome. That is a genius example, actually. That's really good. Every day, 5 o'clock. Yeah, me too. I know. Oh, I know. It's so rough, right? You want to sleep in? You, I, and I have the intention to sleep in on Friday. And I'm like, yeah, I've got no plans. And I feel like I'm, like, I'm lying there and no alarm clock. And I wake up, ah, oh, yeah. And I look at the clock and it's like six. I slept in for an hour. I know I feel disappointed because then the rest of my family isn't up for another four hours. I have teenagers. Anybody have teenagers? Yeah, they sleep forever. Anyway, okay, active. Excellent. Uh, somebody else, give me a value. The, the honesty. Honesty. Give me an example. Yeah. You give always honesty, maybe maybe something unpleasant, but uh, you know, it's, uh, like, it's the honest answer or the honest approach of doing things. What's your name? Anindya Roy. Anind? Anindya Roy. Anindya Roy. Do people call you Roy? Yeah. Okay, Roy. Um, I want you to give me a specific example of a time when you were honest, even when it hurt you. Uh, see, uh, you know, sometimes, you know, my, my supervisor or boss yeah. is something unreasonable from me. Maybe I know this, my team is working hard, but so maybe that's not working very hard. So I, I'm very blunt on his face sometimes. That yeah. You are, you, are, you, are, you are wrong. I know that making him a little bit, uh, this will not be really uh, fruitful for the long time, but because I have my uh, principle that I must not protect my people and say the right thing about them. Yeah. So with even my personal, uh, you know, what is called, uh, cost, yeah. I'll be doing the right thing. Excellent. So you bring that value to work with you, and it informs your behavior. Would other people in your department also say that you're honest? Uh, I think so. I think Good. So. Yeah, excellent. Now, I want you to just uh, take a minute. I want you to turn to the person next to you, tell them one or two of the words, and tell them how those things influence or inform your behavior at work. <laughs> All right, good. I just wanted to give you an, an opportunity. You can carry on these conversations later, and I hope you do. And I hope you do in your departments, and I hope you do with your top line and your bottom line. I hope that you carry on these kinds of conversations, because the more you get to know the people that are around you and the kinds of values that they're bringing, the better it will be for you to understand their behavior. You'll know why they're doing stuff. You'll know that if, you know, if they're being really forthcoming and really like what you might call dramatic, maybe they just call honesty. You know that. But it's easier for you to understand their behavior if you hear their spoken values. And values are only really meaningful when they're espoused, not when they're spoken. Spoken is interesting. That's intention. That's motivation maybe. But intention, motivation, intent is interesting. But only behavior is truly meaningful. Because behavior is what everyone else sees and that's how everyone else judges you. So again, first thing I want you to, I want you to recognize is that uh, this is who you are. And for some of you, that's going to be a little bit of a disappointment, maybe a little bit of a shock. You're going to have to go home and say, oh man, wow, I really am Petrofac. But actually you are. Petrofac is not other than the 13,000 people who have agreed to organize their personal visions for their own individual lives into one collective vision and one collection of collective goals in one particular game on one particular team. So you're on the Petrofac team in the oil and gas game, and in that game you've agreed to be certain kinds of players. And uh, this is where the job of HR and recruitment comes in. This is where we trust our HR department to recruit the kinds of people, not just have the, the right qualifications on the education and experience sides of their CV, but also have the right kind of character. We want the kinds of people that will do well at Petrofac. We want the kinds of team members that will play fair and play well. You know, so we're looking for a kind of person. We always have been since the beginning of Petrofac until now. Everyone is, is eventually hired based on 
uh, not just the resume, but based on an interview. You want to you get to know the person. You want to see the person. So our recruiting department is charged on behalf of all of us with that grand responsibility of deciding the kinds of people that we want on our team and the kinds of players that, that we're going to be playing with for the next 10 days, 10 years, doesn't matter, for as long as we're on this team. It's a third of our lives we're going to spend with these people, and we're trusting them, just like they're trusting us. One question. Yeah. How I feel like in an interview, you'll know about the correct person. He can manipulate in that interview, too. Like yeah, recruiting is another topic. Well, uh, if I have more at the end, I'll come back to that. Yeah? So, look, recruiting, oh, man. You have to have the kinds of people in your recruitment department that are very good at picking out character. And you want to be testing for things like uh, weaknesses and strengths. And you want to be testing for things like um, psychometrics and not only competencies. Competencies you can find on a CV. I've always told my management teams and my executives, a CV will get you an interview, but only your character will get you a job with me. I only, only, only ever hire on character. It doesn't matter if your CV is absolutely chalk loaded, if you are overqualified for the job, and I don't get it from you that you're the kind of person that I would want to dedicate my life and my success to, you're not working with me. That's really important. Because if I'm going to be working with someone, if they're going to be on my team, their efforts are going to contribute to my ability to feed my family, to educate my kids, and to care for my parents. So I want people that are going to run fast. I want people that are going to be smart, be sharp, and, and play hard. I want good players on my team. So when I'm training recruitment departments, I'm training them the same way. You want to hire people that you would invite into your family to improve the quality of your family because that's exactly what they are doing. They're joining a team of 13,000 people who have all agreed, all at the same time, to improve the qualities of, to improve the qualities of each other's lives incrementally, individually, through collective vision and collective goals. And we do that by choosing the right kind of person, not just the right experience and not just the right uh, education. We want the right kind of person. And at some point in your history, in the story of your life, you entered Petrofac and someone at Petrofac looked over your CV and said, yes, they're worthy of an interview. And then someone interviewed you and made a decision on behalf of the entire team that you are exactly the kind of person that we want on this team to play this part, to contribute to the individual goals of everyone else on the team by contributing to our corporate goals. It doesn't matter whether we're making ketchup or we're moving oil and gas around the world, that doesn't matter. What matters is we're with the kinds of people that improve the qualities of our lives. And, and actually, it's not a small part of your life. Remember? It's a third of it. That's a shocking fact when you think about that. You have to face the fact that you're spending a third of your life with these people. This is more than just a job. This is a partnership. So we want the right kinds of people on the team. And as you mentioned, uh, I'm sorry, I don't know your name. My name is Ali Abdullah. Ali Abdullah. Ali? We have corporate values for exactly that reason. Because we want to determine the kinds of behavior that we will exhibit as a team and the kinds of team members that we want to find, that we're looking for. Do you guys all know the corporate values? How many are there? Six. Six. I saw them in the entryway coming in today. So I know that there's media going out. And I want to ask, uh, who knows them? Anyone? You know them? Yeah. What are they? Yeah. Yeah. Excellent. We've agreed that these six terms will govern the kinds of people that we play with and the kind of game that we play. We're in the oil and gas game. We have a strong team. We've got a big team. And one of the reasons that we can play well as a team is because we can expect certain kinds of behavior from each other. And the way that we define that is through values. We define the kinds of behaviors that we expect, not the kinds of intentions, not the kinds of motivations or dreams or ideas, but the kinds of behaviors that we expect from each other. We've agreed that these six words are going to define them. And you think, oh, no, it wasn't me. I didn't have any input on that. I didn't define those words. It was a boardroom, some board retreat with some expensive uh, leadership consultant. They went off to the Maldives and chose these six words and brought them back and imposed them on me. It's not true. 
It's not true because the people who were in that room at the time when those six words were chosen were products of this culture. Those people, uh, the executives, the board, they actually entered Petrofac at some point, spent a number of years of their life being a part of this culture, shaping a part of this culture, being leadership and receiving leadership. And in that culture, they earned the right to describe the kinds of people that they want on that team and to describe the kind of team that they've been playing on for the last number of years of their own lives. They are Petrofac. They are the company, just like you are. So when they made these words up at some board retreat somewhere, uh, they were actually reflecting the kinds of people that they are and the kinds of, of people that they work with. And that's where these words came from. And they're probably true. More often than not, these value lists are true, if they're properly done. Sometimes, unfortunately, they just sit on boardroom walls and they look nice and then they say, oh, these are our values. But what we really want is to be able to exhibit these values. We want to be able to make decisions collectively and individually on this team. And I'll bet you anything, because of the recruitment process, because we're choosing not just CVs, but kinds of people, that they chose the kind of person in you that would exhibit at least three or four of these values naturally. I'll bet you, you can look at those values right now and you can see them in your own behavior. Can you? Remember, when you put work first, work is a dissociative term. It tempts us to believe that it's something other than us. It's something external. It's not. It's not external. It's not other than you. You're putting this, this expectation of this team that you've partnered with for a third of your life temporarily ahead of the expectations of another team which you've partnered with for another third of your life, and that's your family. You've prioritized those couple of hours. It's a small sacrifice on one side for a big gain on the other. But if it didn't meet your personal goals, you wouldn't do it. If you didn't honestly believe that that was leading you to achieve your personal vision for your life, your personal goals, to educate your kids, to care for your parents, if you didn't believe that you're sacrificing a few extra hours to meet that deadline was actually going to get you to those personal goals, you wouldn't have done it. That's, that's, the, that's driven to deliver. That's, that's who you are. We talk about personal life and work life. And very often in management literature, you'll read that phrase, uh, work-life balance, as though work is other than life. It's not true. It's a lie. Your work is a third of your life, and you need to be comfortable with that idea. This is not other than your life. And so whenever I talk about work-life balance, I don't. I talk about uh, work-life blend. This is your life. You need... You deserve to come to work every day knowing that this is not a sacrifice that you're making. This is a third of your life and all of your decisions have led you here. You're empowered to be here and people are counting on you. Your team is counting on you and you're counting on them. And that empowerment, just recognizing the fact that, yes, you're partnered with these people for a third of your life. Some of them were strangers when you started, but none of them are strangers now to varying degrees, you've actually bonded. You've become like small tribes inside Petrofac. You know who the people are that you can count on. You know who they are. You can list them. If I asked you to write it down, who are the three people that you know in this, in this team, in your tribe, who are they? If you needed something and you absolutely just had to have help, who would you go to for help? You know those names. That's your life. That's not work, life, balance. That's, it's work life. That's having people you can count on during this third of your life that you're, that you're spending with us, that you're investing with us, that I'm investing in your personal goals and you're investing in mine. That's amazing. So we're looking for these kinds of people, these six kinds of people. Take a minute. I want you to turn to the person next to you and tell them a story of one time when you've seen one of these values exhibited in the behavior of someone else at Petrofac. I just want you to connect the idea of value to behavior in the life of somebody else at the company, okay? So turn to each other, give each other one story, one example. So you've all heard a couple of examples. Okay, so you know this isn't other than us. This actually is us. This is the way that we behave. 
And these are the kinds of people that we have on the team, you know, because you're looking at them, you're looking at each other. And you also know that when you come to work, you don't come to work for Petrofac, you come to work for the person next to you. You come to work for the other people in your department. You come to par partner with them. And you work for yourself, you work for your family, and you work for the guy at the desk next to you. That's how it always is. That's how people can feel so connected with their work. It's not because they're connected with what they do, it's because they're connected with who they're with and why they're there. Why are we here? Personal goals, personal vision, personal mission. We have all agreed, we've made this agreement with each other as a team that all of our personal visions, missions, and goals and values will be lived out and achieved through corporate vision, mission, values, and goals. That's you. This is Petrofac. This is your day job. It is not other than you. It's the part where you overlap with 13,000 other people in the same game on the same team. That is you. Now I have three guiding principles, values, for how this, this part of you takes place the best. And those values are transparency, discipline, and partnership. And I want to introduce those to you in maybe the form of a couple of stories, if that's okay. I'll tell you a little bit of stories about me. Have you ever been in a sauna, a, uh, an Estonian sauna? I lived in Estonia for eight years. I was in Yemen for five years, six years here in Dubai. Before that, I was eight years in Estonia. And in Estonia, all of the negotiations happen in the sauna. It's like the Meglis here. <laughs> oh man, and that is a transparent experience. Let me tell you. Yes. Oh yeah. Oh man, the first time I was in a sauna, I have to tell you this. Okay, 1994, I am 19 years old. I'm on a trip with my friends to Estonia. I'm there with two other Canadian guys, Lowell and Ruben. And we're, we're like at this little, uh, little uh, cottage site and we go into the sauna and then this, the Norwegian guy that was traveling with us, his name is Sven, he comes. So myself and Ruben and Lowell were sitting there in our swim shorts. We've never been in a sauna before in our lives. We're Canadians. So we're sitting in the sauna. We're, we're like, okay, this is a hot room. So we just sit in the hot room and just be hot for a while, right? Well, Sven, hilarious. Sven, Norwegian guy, he opens the door and he is buck naked, standing there. And we're like, sorry? Too much, Too much transparency, right? He's like, he's absolutely naked and we are laughing. We're like, Sven, dude, clothes. And he is absolutely killing himself laughing. He's like, ha, you guys, what are you doing? And I was like, oh, we're having a sauna. And he goes, no, seriously, what are you doing? And I said, well, we're having a sauna? Because I wasn't sure at that point because he seemed really confident. I wasn't any more confident about what I was doing. So I was like, are we having a sauna? And he goes, no, no, you're not. First of all, you're wearing shorts. Secondly, okay, so here's what's gonna happen, guys. He says, I'm gonna, I'm gonna come in here, we're gonna close the door and I'm gonna put water on the rocks. That's gonna make steam. The steam is gonna slap you on the back and it's gonna hurt and you're gonna scream and wail like little girls. And then uh, I just don't want you to open the door and let my steam out. I just want, I want my steam. So can you please, if you want to leave, just leave now. Otherwise, just sit here and let me enjoy the steam. And I was like, how bad can it be, right? It'll be fun. So I sat there, Lowell sat there, Ruben, he got that. He's like, no, I've heard about this, I'm out. So Ruben checks out, myself and Lowell, oh yeah, we're Canadians, we're tough, we can take anything. We grew up in the winter, of course, we can handle the steam, no problem. So we're sitting there. And Sven comes in, closes the door, sits down, buck naked, grabs a mug of water and just and six, six huge cups of water on the rocks. He was trying to hurt us, right? This was vindictive. He was, he was trying to make, and it worked because there's this huge cloud of steam going against the roof, comes down, absolutely smacks us on the back and we are immediately bowed down. Like myself and Laura like this, I can't breathe because the steam is so hot and I feel like my throat's gonna burn. And I'm like, I'm, Lowell, are you okay, are you okay? And Lowell's like, I can't breathe, man, I can't breathe. And Sven is just killing himself laughing by this point. He is having the time of his life laughing at these two Canadian guys who can't handle the steam in the sauna. And he's sitting, and you know what the funny thing is? When you start a sauna at 110 degrees Celsius and then you put water on the rocks, it becomes a lot hotter than 110 degrees Celsius and nylon shorts start to burn. So the logic of Sven's nudity became really transparent at that point. Myself and Lowell, we're like, oh man, my shorts. He's like, my shorts. So we're blind, practically crying, can't breathe. 
standing up in this short little uh, sauna where there's no ceiling, trying to pull our shorts off because they're starting to hurt. And we throw them into the corner and we sit down and we're just like absolutely. And Sven is killing himself laughing the whole time. He just thinks it's the funniest thing ever. Eventually, the steam goes away. It subsides, right? It starts to calm down a bit. Uh, the steam is gone. And Sven is just like, he's crying. He's laughing so hard. And I look over at Lowell. And I'm like, Lowell, are you okay? He's like, yeah, are you okay? I'm like, fine. Yeah, I'm, I'm good. I feel like I've just been through war. I feel like I've just gone through a whole ordeal here. And I said, Lowell, dude, your necklace. And he looks down like this, so where his, his necklace is kind of draped down and then back up again. And he's got a little cross stuck to his chest because it was so hot and he's like got his finger in behind it was like flick like oh it was so funny anyway so i'm really glad i went through that experience okay so it forced me to be a little more transparent than i was comfortable with at the time but i needed that training because four years later i moved to estonia with my family and that's when i discovered that that's where negotiations happen now it's normal in their culture in estonia Everybody, there's more saunas in Estonia than there are people in Estonia. Did you know that? And, and they, they're born in the sauna and they die in the sauna. Traditionally speaking, that's just how the culture is. So of course, all the negotiations happen in the sauna. And I was sitting there with one of my, uh, one of my colleagues, an older gentleman. He was in his mid sixties and we were sitting in the sauna one day. And I said, why is it? Why is it we always the negotiations happen in the sauna? He says, it's very difficult to lie to somebody who's naked. <laughs> So we've just kind of built trust this way. And it was fun. He had a great house, beautiful sauna outside, and he had like a, a small lake in his backyard. So I would go out to his place on the weekends sometimes, and we would uh, have a sauna run through the snow. And then uh, if we take a chainsaw, cut a hole in the ice, drop the ice down, and then plunge down into this ice water and back up again, and then uh, sit around and talk for a few minutes and go back into the sauna. It was amazing. But it's true, all of the negotiations happened in the sauna and it was an extremely transparent experience. Now, I am not advocating that all of you should go out and, and find a sauna to have your negotiations in, but I am advocating transparency and the kind of transparency that may feel like risk and the kind of risk that may feel like you're exposing a little bit of your, your personal life to the people next to you. Please understand that the person next to you at work, they're here not because of the corporate goals, but they're here because of their personal goals. And so are you. And the better you can understand the personal goals of the person next to you, the more connected they will feel to you and the more you will work hard for them and the more they will work hard for you. That's the truth of it. It's called oxytocin, by the way, in case you do know that word. Have you heard that word, oxytocin? Oxytocin is the chemical that's formed in your brain and is consumed by your brain when you connect with people. It's uh, it's the connecting neurological chemical. So when we, when we feel connected, when we feel like bonded with somebody, when you have a really good experience with someone, uh, when you shake hands with someone, when you make eye contact with someone, when you share a dream or a vision or a goal, you achieve something together, that's oxytocin. That's what makes you feel good when you connect with people. When you, when you hold your kids, when you hug your mom, that's oxytocin. That's what that is. And you can produce that at work. It's very easy. Ask something of the personal life of the person next to you. It is not personal life, work life. It's not, not for any of us. It has never been personal and work. It's always been work-life blend. And we just need to become real about that. And the more you can become real about that with the person sitting next to you and they become real about that with you, the more connected you will feel, the more transparent you will be, and the better you will be able to risk for them and they will be able to risk for you. I want you to take out your phones or your notepads or whatever you have. I want you to write down one of your personal goals. I will go first. One of my personal goals is to be able to put my children, my, I have two teenage kids, 17 and, and 13. My son's going to be 18 in a couple of months. This is his last year of high school. I know. I don't know what to do about that. I don't know what to do about the fact that that makes me old. I think I should feel older than I, than I feel. If you have a, 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 one of your kids graduating from high school, I think you should feel old. I don't feel old yet. So the mirror doesn't tell me exactly how old I am, but my son, he tells me how old I am. He's 18, he's, well, he's almost 18. He's a little bit taller than me now. And one of my personal goals is to be able to put my children through the university program of their choice anywhere in the world. I didn't have that advantage when I was younger. I paid for my own education. And I would like for my children to have that advantage that I didn't have. 
I would like them to be able to choose any kind of education anywhere in the world, and I will cover the cost of that to give them a head start in their lives. That's an advantage I would like to give to them. My being here today for these two hours with you contributes directly to that goal. And this is how. I'm not getting paid for my being here today. But my being here today produces content for my social media. It gives me experience in doing this kind of training. It also gives me an opportunity to audition for the leaders of Petrifact to see if maybe I'm the kind of person that they would want to contribute to the growth and development of this team over a short period of time, over the next couple of years, intermittently in leadership development. That's very transparent. That's why I'm here. And that contributes directly to my ability to put my son into the university program of his choice because it allows me to keep providing value for another amazing team in this market. I get to stay in the market. I love Dubai. I love the Emirates. I love being here. I like the quality of life. I like the style of life. I just think it's the most fun place to be. And I think it's the most incredible place to raise kids. And I am so thrilled to be here. I just want to stay. And so my being here today with you this morning contributes to my ability to stay and to provide for my kids, to give them whatever education they want. Now I want you to turn to the person next to you that you've been sharing with a little bit. I want you to take a risk. Tell them about your personal goal, a goal that happens outside of Petrofac and how your being here on this team contributes to your ability to achieve that goal. Can you do that? Just to take a minute. Yeah, one minute, be transparent, take that risk. That's just to give you an, an example. And again, I hope you use this with your teams. I hope you use this with the others that are working next to you. An example of how transparency can build the connection between who you are and who you are, uh, and also who you're working with. Remember, none of us comes to work for Petrofac. None of us does. We all come to work for ourselves, for our families, and for the people next to us. That's what we come to work for. That's what we're actually doing here. This is who we are and who we're with and why we're here is much more important, much more important than just what we do. We could be in the ketchup game, we could be in the oil and gas game, we could be making luxury shoes, it doesn't matter. The kind of game we're in doesn't matter nearly as much as the kind of players we are, the kind of team we're on and who we're playing with. That's, that's who we are, right? So first, transparency. If you can take a risk like that one minute a day, I guarantee you, over the course of a couple of weeks, the entire environment in your work area will change. It will improve. If you're having trouble with the people next to you, you take a transparency risk, like sharing a personal goal, sharing a personal story, something like that, that will build oxytocin in their, in their mind. And then what happens is the kind of neurological response that they have is they will be more inclined to seek out to offer help to you and to others when you're not looking. They will have your back when you can't see it because of that, because that transparency does that. That's normal. That's how humans respond to that kind of risk. When you take a transparency risk with someone, they bond to you a little bit, that oxytocin is released in the brain, and then they start to help you. They start to work for you just like you're working for them. That's how that works. You know, there's a couple of other chemicals that the brain produces that are very important. Uh, two of my favorites, I think the only two things that I've ever enjoyed in my entire life are dopamine and serotonin. If you've ever heard of those, yeah, serotonin and dopamine. Those are, the, those are the fun chemicals. Serotonin is the chemical that's produced when you're proud of yourself or somebody else is proud of you, when you get recognition for something, that's serotonin. Dopamine is the, the drug that's produced in your brain when you, when you get uh, a high or a hit of something, when you take, take a risk and it pays off, or when you, when you accomplish a challenge, or, or even when you check something off of your to-do list, or you get a like on your Facebook, or you get a bing on your phone. You know that, that fun, happy little sound that your phone makes when you get a message? Bing! That fun feeling that you have in your head, even before you've read the message, you don't have to see who the message is from. You don't have to see what the content is. When you hear that bing, ah, you get a little high in your head. That's dopamine. That's what that is. And there's great ways to manufacture that. One of the ways is, uh, is exercise, of course. So in honor of 30 and 30, of course, I'm doing my 30 minutes of exercise every day for the next 30 days. I hope you are too. That's a, it's actually, it's a really good thing. Uh, but I used to be really, really overweight. Like I was, I don't know, 105, 110 kilos a few years ago, I realized that I just, I, I was not fast enough to keep up with my son anymore. And I didn't like that. And I wanted to change that. So I started to, uh, I started to go to the gym. 
Now there's a couple of numbers I want you to write down. I want you to write down 40, 21, and four. Just write them down. This is gonna be a great little brain hack for you. You can refer to them later. You'll remember what I say uh, after I tell you 40, 21, and four. 40 is the number of seconds you have to move when you get motivated. If you, uh, the, the research shows that if you don't respond in 40 seconds after you feel motivation to do something, you will lose the motivation. It's a chemical response. So you get a little kick in your head when you're like, yeah, it's time to get up and run. You, when you have that feeling, it's time to get up and run, or no, I don't have to eat that, or, or yeah, I wanna do that. It's time to grab a book and start reading. When you have that motivation to do something that you know you should be doing, you have exactly 40 seconds to get up and respond. If you do not follow that motivation with behavior within 40 seconds, you will lose it. Then it's gone. Then you have to wait for the next time when your brain kicks it in and you start to realize your priorities are, are different than you're actually behaving. 21. 21 is the number of days in a row it takes to build a good habit. You have to change the neurological net in your head to associate dopamine, serotonin, oxytocin, adrenaline with uh, a good behavior. And that takes 21 days. So for me, of course, uh, being a leadership expert and being a management expert, I knew exactly what it would take for me to get in shape. So I started to go to the gym. I started to exercise. Guess what happened? I hacked my own head. It worked. I started to get addicted to the endorphins, to the, to the dopamine and the serotonin that was produced when I started to exercise. And I had always read that you could do that, that wow, you know, if you really exercise every day for 21 days, you'll start to build a kind of momentum, an addiction to doing it. It's true, it actually happens. Now that kind of addiction you can build to the exact same chemicals by eating bad food, if you eat uh, sugar, salt, and fat in the same food all at the same time, it releases the same brain chemicals. That creates the addiction. Uh, gambling is exactly the same uh, addiction. It's dopamine addiction. And you can produce that in your head by eating badly, by gambling, by exercising, by reading. You can do that by playing with your kids. Uh, you can do that with, a, there's a whole host of ways that you can produce those same chemicals in your in your head. So if you're not happy with your behavior, you can change it and associate it with dopamine and serotonin production in your head. And after 21 days, you will build a habit that lasts. Four is the number of days it takes to break that habit. If you stop doing it for four days in a row, the odds of you going back drop by drop in half. So you can't take a break of more than four days or you will start to lose that pattern. So 40, 21, and four. So I realized while I was exercising, I was like, oh man, I need these, you know, these challenges, they work out really well for me. And a friend of mine said, why don't you run the Spartan race? This was a few years ago. I was like, Spartan, what's that? And so he told me about these races. Have you heard of them, the uh, obstacle course races? Some of you have heard of them? Have you ever, have anybody ever run a Spartan? Anyone in here? It's fun. You can run with me, it'll be great. Honestly, it's so fun. Okay, so the first time I ran, I ran the five kilometer race. And I, at that time, I'd never run five kilometers in my life. And I thought, oh man, I'm never, I'm, I'm gonna die. That's it. And I told my friends openly, I'm like, I'm, I'm, uh, I was 38 years old, 39 years old at the time. And I said, I said to them openly, I'm pretty sure, I'm only 80% sure I'm even gonna be able to finish this race because it's so hard. It's tough. If you've ever run a Spartan, you run in soft sand for five kilometers and every 500 meters or 600 meters, there's an obstacle or a challenge you have to complete. You have to climb over three walls that are taller than you can reach with your hands. So you have to jump up, grab it and climb over the wall. And then you've got three of them in a row and that's one challenge. You have to swim through a wadi. You have to carry a bucket of sand up a hill or you have to carry a rock, a huge rock, like 50 meters, massive rocks. So it's a big challenge, it's a strength challenge, it's a fitness challenge, and it's tough. And after the end of the five kilometers, I dragged myself across the finish line. I did. But guess how it felt? It was awesome. And they gave me a medal. They gave me this, just for getting across the line. Everybody who finishes the Spartan Reeds gets one of these. It's cool, it's heavy, it's kind of neat. 
Now, it comes from the millennial generation where you get pamphlets and where you get certificates for doing nothing. Everybody gets a participation medal at the end of the game uh, if you're a millennial. When I grew up, it wasn't like that. If you weren't in first, second, or third, you didn't get anything. But I love the whole millennial idea where all you have to do is drag yourself across the line and then they give you a medal. The motivation, motivation. Everybody talks about employee motivation. And you'll hear HR departments all over the world screaming this mantra, employee motivation, employee motivation. I'm now telling you, employee motivation is not what it's cracked up to be. Employee motivation gets you to the starting line. It's fireworks. It's a big show and a lot of hurrahs, but only discipline will get you to the finish. Motivation got me to the starting line. Yes, I was pumped up. It was really exciting. The day of the race, I was really excited. I didn't know if I could finish. It was a great challenge. I was kind of in mediocre shape by that time. I got to the starting line. Everybody's cheering, hurrah, hurrah, hurrah. The horn goes off, and then I were off running. 500 meters later, I'm like, wow, this is tough. Maybe I should just go get a coffee, call it a day. I don't have to be here, right? Nobody's going to make me do this. Nobody's screaming at me to finish. If I don't actually complete this race, who's going to be really disappointed in me? No one, just me. I'm the only person I'm accountable with uh, to finish this race. And from that point on, from 500 meters to, the, to five kilometers, that's discipline. Motivation is already gone, right? Your inspiration is over. We realize that we're not gonna finish this race all by ourselves. It's never gonna get done by yourself. You need partners. In Petrofac, you need 13,000 partners to get the race done, to play the game well. 13,000 people, that's a big group. Anyway, so we're running along and we come up against this. This is called um, the pyramid scheme. The pyramid scheme is a massive ramp. And this picture doesn't do justice to how steep that is. It's steep and it is slippery. You cannot run to the top of this ramp. It can't be done. It's just very steep and very slick. And so the only way for you to get from the bottom to the top is by building a human ladder. And it takes five people to reach the top of this obstacle. So we, myself and my strange new friend that we're suddenly bonded with, he's got oxytocin going on in his head. I've got oxytocin in my head. We're both on adrenaline and dopamine, so it feels great. We're feeling great, we're running together. We come across this wall and we're like, ha, huh. whew, we're gonna need some help. So both of us are looking around, making eye contact, right? Because that's how you do that. We're like, looking around, hey, are you gonna, you're gonna help me? You're gonna help me? Yeah. You're, we're looking around for another, and there's two or three more people there. They're kind of trying to figure out how to solve this too. So they're looking at us, and we're looking at them, and yeah, suddenly we've got a team. There's like six of us. I don't even know their names. They don't know my name, but we've got a shared goal. We have a shared challenge, and we know that if we apply ourselves really well together very quickly, we can accomplish this challenge together. So immediately, I'm on the wall. I'm the, I'm the base. So I'm standing in the mud, I'm halfway up the wall like this, and then the next person, don't know who it is, is standing on my shoulders, lean against the wall. And then the next person, I can feel them climbing up my shoulders, standing on my shoulders, foot on the top of my head while they climb up the next person onto their shoulders, and then they're leaning against the wall. And then person number four climbs up my shoulders, then the next person, then the next person, and we have this human ladder, and I am standing there with all of, because I know these people are counting on me. They're counting on me. If I buckle, everybody fails. If I don't play my part right, everybody suffers. We're all in the mud. Everybody pays that price. So I am there as strong as I can be. I'm as rock solid as I can get. And person number five climbs up me. I don't know their name. I don't know who they are, but they are standing literally on my neck right here. And I'm cool with that because I know, I know that it's not very long before they get to the top and they get to the top and guess what they do? They don't keep running, they turn around and they reach down and they start to build the human ladder from the top. So that person becomes the anchor at the top, reaches down, grabs the arms of the person below them and guess who's first to climb up? Me, because I'm at the bottom. So I am grabbing onto some stranger's waist and stranger's shoulder, and I am climbing up this human ladder to get to the top of this pyramid scheme to where this stranger reaches out and grabs my hand and pulls me up. Because we did it with eye contact, because we couldn't do it without each other. It absolutely has to be done with help. So now there's six of us. 
We didn't know each other at the beginning of the day. Now we've conquered these couple of huge obstacles. We're running. A few kilometers later, we hit this. Everest. This is called Everest. It's a, it's a, a quarter pipe ramp, very slippery, very tall. One person has to do this. And then they have to help the others because most people cannot get up this. You need one all-star runner, one really fast person with a great reach and a huge leap to run and leap and grab onto the top and pull themselves up so that they can reach their hand down to lower the distance that the other people have to run and jump. So then everybody else is running and jumping after that. And guess who's first? Yeah. So I gave it everything I got. Because I had run Spartan before. I had run all three of those Spartan races. I'd completed my trifecta and I knew that I was fast enough. I could do this. I can do this. So I'm running all of it and my teammates, all five of them are yelling at me. Go, whoever you are. Run, whatever your name is, go. And so I'm running with everything I got and I leap, grab the thing and I'm pulling myself up and I pull and my instinct is to not run. My instinct at that time, I, cause I'm already programmed. I'm already with my team. My instinct is to immediately turn around, drop down, chest to the floor, reach my hand out. Cause somebody's gonna come up looking for some help and I'm gonna be that person. And yeah, we all got across the finish line all at the same time. So even though in a Spartan race, I might have been faster than most of them, I might have been stronger. We all crossed the finish line all at the same time because it was the kind of race that you can't run alone. I noticed a couple of things, right? One, I really like helping people. It was fun. I wasn't mad at all that I didn't get to finish in, a, in an amazing time. The amount of time it took me to ra win the race or to, to finish the race didn't matter. That wasn't important. What mattered was, I, like I had a really great time reaching back and pulling people up, and I had a really great time having people crawl up my back to accomplish these things. That was fun. Helping people is fun. Actually, you get a hit out of it. And then other people help other people because of that. So you produce oxytocin, they produce oxytocin, everybody wins, right? Helping people is fun. The other, the other thing that I noticed was, every once in a while, a Spartan runner would try to finish a Tough mutter. So, it happened, I think, three or four times that we were on a major challenge, one of those big challenges, and some lone runner would run and grab onto my back and crawl up me to get to the top of the wall and then climb the wall and they wouldn't reach back. They would just jump to the other side and keep running. Oh man, that was so disappointing. So disappointing because you're expecting that the help that you give to someone else, they're gonna to give to you, right? And when that happens, I noticed something that happened. When a Spartan runner runs a Tough mutter, they lose respect. I didn't respect them. They were faster, yes. They finished the race sooner, yes. But they finished without my respect and without my honor. Because they used me. They literally used me to do that. And that's, the way that working with people in the company feels when we partner with people next to us, when we make eye contact, take risks, when we're transparent and we're disciplined, we expect everyone around us to run with just as much passion as we run. And we expect that when we help somebody, they're gonna help us back. And when they don't, when we find somebody climbing the ladder to the top while stepping on the heads of the people around us, we don't honor that. There's no respect for that. We're a team. We achieve as a team. We finish our goals as a team. We're quality and co cost conscious as a team. We're driven to deliver as a team. That's the kind of game we're in. We're not actually running a Spartan. We're actually running a Tough Mudder. That's the kind of game that we're in at Petrofac. We're in a team game. This is the kind of game, the oil and gas game, this is the kind of game you cannot win alone. You have to have a team and in oil and gas, Generally speaking, you have to have a big team. It is a big game. Here we've got 13,000 players on our team. And we're all hoping that all of us is putting in absolutely our, our best effort all the time. And then if we're lucky, from time to time, we finish well. 
And this is, this is what winning a really big bid feels like. I know because I've done it. I've been on teams where we've won really big bids, hundreds of millions of dollars. And when you get to that place where you're like, yeah, we got it, we got the contract, then that's how it feels. You've been running through the mud. You're absolutely destroyed. You're tired. It's a lot of midnight hours. Your family has paid a little bit of price in the, in the fact that you've been passionate about your work and everybody's counting the cost and you're dirty, but you won. You did it. And that's how it actually feels to win a big project, to execute well, to finish on time, to deliver on time, to deliver with a good margin. When you deliver with a margin that's wider than any other project you've ever done since you've joined Petrofac, you feel that way. You're like, yeah, I widened the margin. I got it. It may have been 2%, but man, that 2% feels amazing. You get that achievement and not as an individual, you get that achievement as a team. That's a tough mutter. That's not a Spartan. We're going to win this game, not because of the game that we're in, but because of the players that we are, right? Because of who we're actually with. I want you to be able to say that this morning, these two hours were the most entertaining and insightful and innovative and perhaps meaningful hours that you've spent at Petrofac in a long time because it allowed you to multiply your effectiveness, not just for uh, the company as a collective with collective vision and values and goals, but for yourself personally, because you have personal vision and values and goals. I want you to recognize that you are what you do. Outside of work, at work, you are what you do. Your behavior reveals who you are. And part of your behavior, at least a third of your life, your behavior is here, in this environment, on this team, in this game. This is not other than you. This is you. This is you for all of us. This is who I am too. This is absolutely 100% who I am. It's not my job. It's, it's me. This is a third of my life I spend doing this. It's not other than me. And the people that I partner with, some of them are here in the room and they're amazing people. And I know that if, uh, if we needed to cross a wall, I would stand there and they can climb on my shoulders and I would help them. And they would do the same for me. So those are the three values that I would say contribute most to effective work-life blend. Transparency, discipline, and partnership. Transparency because taking a risk builds, builds community with people. Uh, discipline because changing your behavior reveals new values to people and it achieves both your corporate and your personal goals at the same time. And then partnership because you recognize you're in the kind of game that you can't win on your own. You can't. You can't beat this on your own. You have to work with these 13,000 other players, these other team members. So that creates this value in us. And recognizing the blend between our personal goals and our corporate goals, that more than anything else, that is meaningful management. That's, that's where coming to work every day is, becomes meaningful when we recognize all of our decisions have led us here. This is a third of our lives and we are partnered with people we're passionate about partnering with. All right. Uh, that's it for me. Thank you very much. I really appreciate your time. Thank you.